Well, welcome to the show, guys. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for that fantastic introduction. Ah, uh, yeah. No, I, um, I'm um, i big fans of, of both of yours. And so I'm sure this is going to be a very interesting conversation to say the least. So deep platforming, it's something that we're seeing much more of these days. You see it on YouTube, you see it on Patreon, you see it on Facebook, you see it on Twitter. I mean, it seems that we're getting more and more constrained by what is allowed to be said, what is allowed to be done. And, uh, and all of these platforms that used to be kind of this bastion of free thought where we could have these free flowing conversations, they, there's more and more tight knit control being implemented on them. I want to start by talking about um, uh, OnlyFans in particular. So recently there was this incredibly embarrassing moment for them where they announced that, oh, no, not allowed porn on OnlyFans anymore. And everyone's like, what, what are we going to have? And they're like, oh, we're going to have cooking shows and it's like do you have any idea who your user base is do you have any idea who the customers are like this this isn't going to work and the rumor was that mastercard and other payment processors had put pressure on them and said you know you need to toe the line that we're not going to bank you anymore you're not going to be able to have a payment processor it really highlighted the fact that payment processors have such control over what platforms are allowed to exist and what content creators are allowed to exist so ala you have an incredibly popular OnlyFans account. Um, and I want to dive into your experience on that. And your experience, I don't know uh, if you've tried to do the same thing on other platforms and have been deplatformed. Just kind of, I want to talk about the rigidity of uh, the places where you're allowed to express yourself and uh, whether OnlyFans, I mean, they've, they've changed their mind for now, but whether this is something in the future where they can once again be co-opted and uh, a bunch of people could be deplatformed. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that this problem is getting worse in recent years. Um, like I've been a sex worker on various online platforms for a decade now. And in the beginning, like nobody really noticed or like kind of cared about the sex work thing. It's like the visibility of OnlyFans, I think, really made it vulnerable. Like suddenly people outside of the sex work industry have very strong opinions about like what should or should not be done uh, between consenting adults online, which is really unfortunate. Um, but yeah, I just anticipate this is going to continue to happen. Uh, I've had like my financial like systems having issues because I'm associated with sex work. For example, Coinbase like froze my account because I used like some crypto in association with like exchanging porn or something. Uh, it took me a long time to get my Bitcoin out of there, which in hindsight was a great move, but uh, still not a good uh, experience. And so like, I'm not surprised that OnlyFans made this move. It, I, I don't think they wanted to. Like the people who run OnlyFans have been in porn for a long time. Um, so I, I, I think it's just like pressure from the external things and you run to something like Fansly. And then, of course, once attention comes on them, then there's going to be pressure on them. And it's just a rinse and repeat. Uh, the, the atmosphere is not very friendly to sex work right now. No, oh, absolutely. And uh, Lee, I want to throw it to you just to kind of get a background of where these policies might have come from, because there's something called Operation Choke Point. And it's this idea that there are kind of these informal letters being sent out uh, to banks where certain industries were just deemed high risk and the bank accounts were shut down. Walk me through kind of that, that history and your perspective of that and how this pressure is kind of really a form of censorship when it comes down to it. Yeah, definitely. So there are certainly a lot of people, um, some involved with particular religious groups, some with different political groups that are attempting to put pressure on payment processors, banks, and other kinds of financial service providers in order to, as you're saying, um, highly censor or restrict people involved with certain at-risk industries. But the one thing I want to emphasize that doesn't only apply to businesses. They can actually, it depends on your country and jurisdiction, apply to people. You can have people whose accounts are labeled as high risk because the they're personally involved in the sex industry. And even if, let's say, like OnlyFans, for example, does have their MasterCard deal, I believe, still running, uh, but they had to change the way that they operate. They have to review everything before things goes up, which obviously makes a backlog um, of mm -hmm. all the content that is trying to be posted on the website. But there's also, like, even when things are still working, uh, there's still restrictions on certain kinds of words that can be used, uh, certain kinds of role play or fetishes that they can cater to. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, age play or diaper play um, or people who use, like, uh, food coloring for fake blood and different kinds of medical play. All of these are heavily restricted even when they eventually meet all the other requirements that MasterCard and other kinds of payment processors uh, require for them. So it's really important to not only think about the fact that, like, yes, these organizations are restricting who gets access, but even when you get that access, it's only 
if you follow certain rules. And that means it just changes the way that we talk about sexuality online and other kinds of topics that are deemed high risk. Uh, it really defines the public conversation and what people are and aren't allowed to say publicly. And it's always nice when they repress conversations. It just completely eliminates it. These things don't just bubble under the surface. It's just, just stop it. And no one will ever talk about this stuff. Good work, uh, Prohibition. Um, Ayla, I want to throw it to you. So on your site, you accept cryptocurrency. And uh, crypto, as we know, is peer-to-peer. -peer. There's no intermediary. It kind of eliminates this idea of middlemen getting in the way and dictating who can and can't get paid. What's been your experience with that like? Has it been a popular form of payment? I know that it's we're still it's a burgeoning industry, you know, and uh, probably most of your customers aren't into crypto yet. Do you see that changing in the near future? Uh, I hope it changes. I've been accepting crypto for my sex work for many, many years at this point. I'm a very strong proponent of it. Um, but it's not very scalable in the way that OnlyFans is scalable. Like with OnlyFans, it's very like, I can reach a couple thousand people all at once and then have them do payments. Right now, the way that I accept crypto payments is through basically like a tip system. Like if you want to, you can come like pay me manually through this. And it's, it's like kind of awkward. It's something that I sort of have to like communicate individually to people. And there's not like an automatic way, which is I think really hindering at this point. Um, but I could definitely see, I feel like there's a lot of stuff in the works right now to try and solve that problem. And as soon as it does, I am 100% behind this. And I think it's definitely the future. We just need a lot more education for other sex workers, because like sex workers at this point um, are pretty uh, hesitant around crypto. It's not really something they're very familiar with. Um, and so you have to have really reach that demographic in order to make this thing work at all. Yeah. Why do you think it is that sex workers have not dived into this? Because I always figured that, you know, the sex work industry, um, it's a fringe industry and it will be one of the first places people could realize the benefits. The same way that, you know, prohibition on drugs. It's the you know, drug online marketplaces is one of the first places that Bitcoin have became popularized. It's these fringe use cases that really build the foundation of this. So what's your take on why se the sex work industry hasn't really you know taken hold on crypto yet? Well, I mean, I, I suspect that some parts of the sex work industry are, are definitely seeing this, but when it comes to like the individual person, like uh, right now, like the biggest market for sex workers is basically like the 22 year old college student in her dorm or something like this. Um, and, and this is a demographic that is not very like technically literate with something that is very associated with like masculine brain, libertarian type ideals. Uh, they tend to be more interested in like social uh, issues and uh, things like fairness or whatever, and, and sort of like don't trust um, things that like are not like understandable through that frame. It is this is my theory? I could obviously be wrong about it, um, but yeah. So I, I think that we're just we're just talking about a kind of demographic that just sort of isn't inherently interested in this sort of thing, um, which makes it a lot harder. Mm -hmm. I also yeah, think there's something to say ahead. about the client base, right? Like generally a lot of the client base are older men and teaching uh, old dogs new tricks is quite a challenge. So I know a lot of sex workers who are very interested and very involved in this space, um, but it takes a long time to onboard your regular customers into learning how to use this tool. So actually with OnlyFans has a younger customer base in my experience Ooh. and in my surveys than other forms of sex work in the past, uh, because OnlyFans is a much on average lower entry fee, which basically mm -hmm. opens it up to uh, younger men who tend to have less money. Yeah. Interesting. I want to also talk about, I mean, we've talked about payment processes as being this uh, controlling aspect of the industry, one that can in enable censorship. Um, but it's not just that. I mean, AWS uh, deplatform Parler, and you have all these web services that kind of control the internet. We have domain name services that control the internet, but we are seeing a push now towards decentralized web services. We're seeing um, Web 3.0 really start to flourish, decentralized platforms. So Lee, I'll throw this to you to start off with. Do you see us, I mean, how long is it going to take to get to a point where we truly have decentralized platforms where people can put up content without fear of retribution and, and that they're going to be kicked off because it doesn't, doesn't align with someone else's tastes? A really long time. I think a really long time. It took us a really long time until every company had a website, 
right? Like imagine 20 years ago, there were still companies that were saying like, we have an in-person store, we don't need a website. So it's going to take a really long time for people to transition to a new kind of digital infrastructure. Something else that's really important to uh, talk about when we're thinking about deplatforming is it's not only payment processors and banks that are deplatforming people. It's also things like, we you know, like Instagram, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it's also things like Braintree and Stripe, which is, you know, on the back end of a lot of stores mm -hmm. that are running. So you can really, if you're um, identified as a sex worker and your bank shuts you off, you can get shut off from also developer platforms and tools uh, that people use to make their own solutions. Uh, you can just get cut off across the board, across the internet from so many different things. So it's really important when we're thinking about Web3 to think about people who both have access to these things and people who don't because they've already been identified as someone who is high risk by the system. Absolutely. Ayla, I also wanted to throw back to you. I alluded at the start, like you're, you're kind of a queen of uncomfortable conversations. Um, and I love that. And, uh, and that's also not a popular thing these days. I mean, it's so tightly controlled what people are and are not allowed to talk about online. So talk to me just about this climate of censorship in general, and what trajectory you see for society if this continues, because it, it doesn't look like it's very promising. You know, I hope something comes in and, and and, and saves us from all of this. But what's been your experience? Yeah, I, I think this is sort of like the tendency of society is like, it feels like we're sort of becoming open-minded, but rather our, our uh, sphere of what we like is mm -hmm. sort of moving over into the things that we think are okay and sort of like leaving behind a lot of things. It's not like actually broadening, even though it feels like it. Mm -hmm. um, I've like run into a lot of trouble with my questions. Like I've had people on my safe for work Twitter because I tweet like various polls, um, like find that and then like excommunicate me from like sex worker groups, for example, um, or like go after my advertising sources for my OnlyFans and try to get the people in charge to to ban me uh, because they're like, we should not be allowing this person to thrive. And it's like, it's like literally questions that I'm asking <laughs> or, or like not even like claims, right? And and so I feel like pretty sensitive to this. And luckily I'm in a position where I'm relatively um, uncancelable. Uh, sex work mm -hmm. platforms themselves tend to already be kind of on the gray areas and mm -hmm. tend to be uh, less likely to deplatform you uh, of their own will, right? Like other things like Instagram or something might, but like the sex work, they, they won't if, unless they're forced to, especially when it comes to, to social issues. Like if you might be tweeting something controversial, uh, which is great. I love that part. Uh, but but now, like, especially with OnlyFans, a lot of the, uh, the what is required to make money on that platform is linked to the rest of the internet now. Um, and so the rest of the internet becomes the, the vulnerable thing. If you were deplatformed from everything except OnlyFans, if I was, uh, my income on OnlyFans would go to zero pretty fast. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a really important thing. Yeah, for sure. And Lee, what's been your experience with this? I mean, has Days Femme ever come into uh, like censorship issues or like have there ever been a risk of being deplatformed by touching, you know, uh, controversial topics or anything? So we're really lucky for Defem. It's a very, very new magazine. We're only like a few months old. So we haven't had any deplatforming issues yet. In my work as a journalist, I've many, many times to the point where it almost became routine, had people try and get me fired for saying things that had nothing to do with my work that they just didn't like as an opinion. Uh, kind of like she was saying in terms of her experience. It, it, got, it got to the point where it's routine. But that's, I think what's interesting about that is that we have a culture now in which when someone is saying something that makes us uncomfortable, there's a lot of people whose initial reaction is we need to ostracize them from the internet. We need to make sure they're unemployable. We need to make sure that they get banned, you know, have their account reported, things like that. And my favorite thing about it is when people would get angry, they would say things like, I hate cancel culture, but she in particular deserves this. <laughs> I hate, you know, yeah. in general, I'm against censorship, but she in particular needs to be censored. And so I think the important thing for people to remember when they're considering their own biases is that there's probably some opinion that you have or some kind of kink that you're interested in that someone else but thinks really is that offensive. And it's important to not think about um, this this one thing making a person a pariah, but really stepping back and being like, okay, is anyone being harmed? How do we reduce that harm? Um, how do we engage in a conversation which everyone can be respectful um, without necessarily uh, needing to ostracize any opinions that don't align with our own? Having opinions or conversations or platforms in which there's robust diversity is really beneficial to everyone involved. And so sometimes it means being uncomfortable with the kind of conversation involved. And being a master of uncomfortable conversations is actually a skill set that is um, applicable in a lot of fields, not only sex work, uh, but sex workers may be a really good example of that. Let's dig into that a little more because um, I love uncomfortable conversations and I love the idea of them, but let's talk about why they're important. So Ayla, you know, 
is is it really necessary that we make people uncomfortable? Like, why is that an important part of growing society and civilization? Why is it necessary? Oh, it's so necessary. I mean, as you might know, I was raised like an extremely devout conservative Christian, uh, like homeschooled, isolated from the outside world, I'm gonna become a housewife, all that stuff. And and it, like the uncomfortable conversations are what rescued me. Like that's the mm-hmm. thing. And like when you're locked in a world like that. The things that are normal are just normal and, and it is protected with like a sense of moral disgust. So like the things that would have challenged my beliefs were tied to a moral thing. And it was framed as like, we're protecting the people inside this. We're actually working for good. If gay people get married, this is actually going to cause concrete harm to society and families. Like all of these things were framed in, in the ways that our moral disgust today is framed. And, and the parallels are really eerie to me and I, and I really dislike it. And so anytime that there's a sense, this, this moral boundary, it's like, oh, well, that is obviously horrifying. You shouldn't question it. Like, why are you even asking that question? That's when the red flags go up. I'm like, I know that move. That move is like what <laughs> kept me in that culture and all of the people that I loved very dearly in a culture that was really damaging to them. And so like moral disgust is not something I trust whatsoever. And it feels like almost like a compulsive duty to question it wherever I can see. Yeah, it's so important. Lee, I, I want to throw back to you and, and just kind of final thoughts because we're running out of time here. Um, now, we've talked about all the issues with censorship, why it's important to push boundaries, but we know that the current state of the internet, <clears throat> pardon me, is not one where boundaries are allowed to be pushed. It, there's so much control over what is and isn't acceptable speech, what ideas are and are not allowed to be engaged with. Um, so, we're seeing also a push towards more decentralized technology. Both of you are involved in the cryptocurrency uh, community, so you understand the power of that aspect of decentralization. But talk to me about possible solutions that you see. Like, what direction do we need to go in as a society to really safeguard speech and allow free expression of thought? So, Lee, I'll, I'll start off with you. Yeah, definitely. So I think that the best thing, I think that uh, you've actually alluded it to earlier, that we can do is educating individuals. So I know a lot of sex workers who use things like BTC Pay Server um, or maybe Sphinx Chat or other kinds of uh, decentralized tools, but that only can be used yourself without reliance on someone else who can deplatform you when you understand how it works. So individual education actually can have a systematic impact uh, when over years, it scales. One person teaches another, teaches another, teaches another. Um, education is really very, very important. And the other thing is also to, um, as someone I believe in your earlier interview with Isaiah said, uh, voting. Voting really helps in terms of voting for people that want to protect your privacy, want to protect your rights, um, want to protect that ability to have diverse opinions in the public sphere. Um, and the other thing is voting with your feet. So it might be a little bit uh, more complicated or expensive to pay a sex worker with Bitcoin uh, versus maybe only subscribing to her OnlyFans. But um, choosing to act in a way that aligns with your morals has a real economic impact and societal impact. Uh, so those are the things I think are the most important. Such a great point. ALL, I'll throw to you for the same question. What was the question again? It's just like the direction like of society. What do we need to do to change things oh. and really safeguard freedom of speech? How does decentralization play a role in all of that? Oh, I think it's super important to let people know that uh, that like the trade-off is worth it. I think a lot of people like if you see the negative side and say, oh, well, there's bad things that happen if we allow freedom of speech, so we shouldn't. And there's like not this awareness that there's going to be bad things that happen no matter what, if you allow any sort of freedom or new thing. Mm. And like right now we have a lot of freedoms that have downsides, but we accept that as default because it's sort of baked into the culture. And so it's being like, okay, whenever you think about this thing, you have to stop thinking about, is there a downside? You have to think about the trade-off. Like everything needs to be evaluated in trade-offs. And it's like a, like a wide scale, like shift in thinking that I think needs to happen and would like really write a lot of things. Absolutely. Well, thank you both. You're both uh, two women who really push the boundaries of acceptable thought. I love that. I, I wish more people would do that. So thanks for all the work that, that both of you do in the space. And thanks for joining us on the, the show today. Thank, thank you. you so much.